Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Holy Word. We're doing studies in the Gospel according to Matthew. And today we're in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Gospel according to Matthew 11 and 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. This is an absolutely beautiful series of verses, because coming on the heels of the indictment of the towns where the Lord Jesus had done his mighty works, and that light shone so brightly upon them, the Lord now promises revelation of himself and showing the father showing us what god is like so it's not all doom and gloom it's not that all of humanity is consigned to judgment and we will be inevitably condemned and there's no alternative no it's true those who reject the light are going to have to bear the consequences those who do not come to the lord jesus christ are lost and if someone leaves the world that way it is indeed dire. We can speak of eternal consequences because it will mean eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. But the wonderful thing is the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and he is the one who seeks and saves that which is lost. He's the one who was sent to destroy the works of the devil and to reconcile the created world back to God. And he's going to bring in all things in the purposes of God, even the new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So on the heels of that stark warning of having this truth presented to them, having the light, having so many miracles, empirically verifiable data that showed who the Lord Jesus Christ was and why he had come, and yet trifling with that, playing with it, not taking the truth seriously, that would bring the judgment on Capernaum, on Bethsaida, on Chorazin. But when we talk about salvation, it is open to all. It's at that time that the Lord actually expostulates in prayer here. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And I think it shows our Lord's methodology that he was one who took prayer very seriously, to put it mildly. He is one who we have numerous instances in the Gospels that he rose early to pray. We have instances that he prayed all night, and when he received his food, he prayed. And I think many times during the day, our Lord was always ready to lift his heart and voice to the Father and to pray. And this is such an instance, and this is a prayer of thanksgiving. We're coming up on the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. As I record this, it's just a little over a week away. And so he says, I thank you, Father. Now, it is great to stop and thank God. I mean, the Lord gives us an excellent example here of what we should do. We should really imitate him here, that we should be a thankful people, especially if we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, how much we have to thank God for, to thank him for giving us his son. Uh, we have a song that's sometimes sung, thank you, O my Father, for giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. It's wonderful to thank God for giving the Son, for giving the Holy Spirit, for giving salvation through them, for giving us a share in that inheritance in the realms of light that Colossians 1 will talk about. And so he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. So this is instructive too. On the one side, the Lord is approaching God, his Father, with great intimacy and it is the Lord Jesus who has opened the way to this intimacy for us, that we can call God our Father. We can call him my Father individually. And even the Holy Spirit was sent to teach us to cry Abba Father to God, as Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 will tell us. So there's that intimacy, and he ever had that close relationship with his Father. This is God the Son speaking to God the Father. A more extended prayer, of course, is found in John 17. And that's probably the one that ushers us into the deepest mysteries of the relationship and love within the Trinity. 
of the Father and the Son speaking together there. And here the Lord again is speaking to his Father, but at the same time he calls him Lord of heaven and earth. So in spite of the intimacy, we might say, there's also the acknowledgement, the full understanding of the great height, the position that the Father is in, that he is so far above this world. And in taking his position in this world as a man, our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, humbled himself. Though he was co-equal with the Father from all eternity and intrinsically in his being remained that, nevertheless, by adding humanity to himself in his manhood, he submitted to the will of his Father in all things. And he humbled himself here, and he called the Lord, Lord of heaven and earth. So this is the one who is sovereign over all things heavenly and over all things earthly. And when you think about that, that's positively astonishing. I mean, if we can only think about the visible creation, what we know of earth and what we know of heaven, to be Lord over that would be a massive chunk of territory, a massive responsibility to have that many living organisms under our control and that many ecosystems and processes like we can see just on planet Earth. But if we lift our eyes to the moon and the sun and the stars and the various planets of our solar system, knowing that there are other galaxies, knowing that there are uh, many other nebulae and so forth, and yet the Father is over all those things. He's Lord of heaven and earth. And of course, Lord of the highest heaven, the dwelling place of God. So here is one who is the utmost. Here is one who is absolutely great and superior and sovereign in everything that he does. And then he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. So obviously, it's God's prerogative to reveal and also to conceal. And if we're going to know the truth, we've got to go to God. So many people search for the truth and they throw God right out of the equation. They say, well, I can find truth independently of God. No, the Bible tells us he's the God of truth. The Lord Jesus himself in John 14, 6 said, I am the truth. And he calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. So truth is found in God. God is the arbiter of truth. He defines what reality and right and wrong are. And if we're going to know the truth, we've got to come to him and he must reveal it to us. And so he chooses to conceal certain things. You've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. Now, God, of course, isn't against wisdom. He's written numerous scriptures and whole books of the Bible, like Proverbs, to instruct us in wisdom and to urge us to seek for wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we're told in Proverbs. So wisdom, if we're talking about godly wisdom, is a good thing. But the way the Lord's using the wise and the prudent here seems to be a contrast between people in the human realm that are erudite, that are well-educated, that are lettered, that are people with many grace, little gray cells, as Hercule Poirot used to say in the novels. You know, people that are brilliant intellectually speaking and very accomplished in intellectual endeavors. And prudent speaks to a certain cleverness that they are able to get things done. And whether we think of industry or business or the tech world or even politics, we can think of many shrewd, prudent people who accomplish great things. But when we speak about eternal things, when we speak about the way to God, it's not the wise and the prudent. In fact, 1 Corinthians is going to tell us that God has confounded the wise and he's confounded the mighty by using the things that are foolish and weak in human eyes to put those things to shame. Because it's not the wisdom of the wise. It's not the understanding of the prudent. It's not natural intelligence that gets you there to the point that God wants you to know. Now, there are many believers uh, throughout the Bible and throughout church history, right down to the contemporary scene, that are intellectually gifted people. They're very endowed with great minds. And we're thankful for them. Many of them have been tremendous helps in various endeavors. Some have been scientists and they've improved the lot, not only of Christians, but of people all over the world that don't know the Lord either. And they do their science 
because they believe in the creator God and they want to honor him in the research they do. Others have uh, invented things or started businesses and accomplished great things. They've been prudent in certain senses. There's nothing wrong with wisdom and prudence in their place, but we have to realize their limits, that the wise and the prudent Christian hasn't come to the Lord because they're smarter than somebody else or because they're more on the ball, cleverer than someone else. They have come to the Lord because they've been, uh, they've had the light, shall I say, shine on them. It has been revealed to them that God is the father, that God has sent his son, that there's this great gospel. If God didn't send his word, as Romans 10 asks the question, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they be sent? God has initiated this tremendous thing, not only in planning salvation and executing salvation by sending his son to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again from the dead and to ascend into glory, but also he has revealed this to human minds. He has sent prophets and preachers into the world to tell forth his word and to bring people uh, to himself. So there's a tremendous amount in just these opening words of our Lord's prayer. He says, you've not uh, disclosed this, you've hidden these things rather from the wise and prudent and you have revealed them to babes. Now, the wonderful thing about this is that the babes, that concept is a great leveler. It is an, an egalitarian term, shall we say. It includes everybody. If I talk about people that are very intellectually smart or very clever in business or very accomplished in the sciences or in politics or in some other human endeavor, well, that rules many of us out. We're not going to get there. Many of us say, well, I'm just an average Joe. You know, I just have average intelligence and I have average ability and I'm not in the book of who's who and I'm not any kind of celebrity or anybody that people look to as somebody really important on this world. Well, whether a person is considered an Albert Einstein or whether a person, you know, is uh, comparatively uneducated, uh, it doesn't matter. They both have this in common. They, they started out as a baby. Everybody started out as, a, as an infant. And the smartest man or woman in the world starts out in complete helplessness and dependence on others, even to keep them alive in their earliest moments and days and months on earth. So it's a great leveler when we talk about babes. You know, babes have a tremendous capacity to learn and there's a lot of potential there. But in looking at two babies side by side, you don't know which one's going to grow up to be a computer genius and which one might grow up to be the next Rembrandt and which one's going to grow up to be someone who starts some major company and which one's just going to be an ordinary person working a regular job and being a good neighbor and a solid citizen, we might say. We can't tell the accomplishment just by looking at the babies. They're there and they're dependent. And the thing about infants and little children, toddlers and small children, is that they have to be taught everything. And the babes have had this revelation made to them. The people that weren't considered great theologians or tremendous scholars or scientists or philosophers, these weren't the people that the Lord brought the gospel to. He brought it to everyday, ordinary sort of people, people like the 12 that he's talking to in many of these passages in Matthew. So this is tremendous when we think about the Lord revealing the Father and the Father revealing himself, that it is open to all, that it is something God wants to give, not just to a select few, not just to a little coterie of intellectuals somewhere, or a secret society of the most brilliant, or the next meeting of Menza, the society of geniuses, you know. No, the Lord, he wants to save everybody, and he wants to reveal who he is to everybody. So rich and poor, uh, great and small, we might say, educated and uneducated, elite and relatively inferior, all of these people, according to human estimation, doesn't matter. We're all in the same boat in that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we're all in the same boat too, in that God loves us and wants to save us. And no matter what we are or what we've done in the past or who we are, shall we say, God wants to show himself to us 
in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to prove that he loves us and wants to save us by showing us his scripture that says Christ Jesus died for sinners and that he rose again to prove all this is true. So I hope you know him, friend. You know, some people think themselves right out of salvation and not that they have it and lose it. I'm saying salvation is presented to them and they say, oh, that's too simple. I must do something. Or that's too simple. I don't want to be with the hoi polloi, you know, with the unwashed masses, as they might think of other people. I'm superior, they say. And the gospel demands that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of the Lord. And we say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. All we can say is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the attitude, whether you're small or great, rich or poor, smart or stupid, relatively speaking, God says, come to me for salvation. Come to the Lord Jesus and be saved. And I hope you will, my friend. Thank you for listening.